So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this session. Alternatively, thank you for staying in the room and not leaving to go to another session. <laughs> um, and thank you, Kenji, who's, uh, who's an exhibiting a researcher using Internet of Things in the back row to prove that it happens. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the um, EPSRC Internet of Things Research Hub, which is PETRUS, which stands for Privacy, Ethics, Trust, Reliability, Acceptability, and Security. I'm still struggling to remember what the R is every time I go through that. I won't get there. Um, uh, but mainly I want to sort of set the scene and then, then open up the discussion because I, I really think we need a, a conversation between the Internet of Things research world and the software. Uh, the, the expertise that's in research software that's in this room, and I want to think about what that conversation looks like and how we can facilitate it. Um, so, in terms of what I want to do in the next few minutes, um, I'm simply going to give you a very quick overview of the Internet of Things uh, research hub. I've got some slides, uh, which are the sort of standard, this is the hub slides, and I've got some on a specific project within there, which I want to tell you about. Um, but then, really, at the end, I want to know what is it that we as the research software and software sustainability community want to say to the Internet of Things software development community, uh, and vice versa. Um, what, do, uh, we, you know, what do we want to say to the, the others in the software community about Internet of Things? So that's, that's where we're headed. Um, it kind of all started a, a few years ago when the uh, government... Office of Science did what's called a blackout review of Internet of Things. So this was a, a big review, really looking at the, the potential of Internet of Things to the UK. Uh, it involved many experts from industry and academia, it involved many government um, scientific advisors. And the, it's, it's, it's quite a good report. There are, there are a number of good things about the report. One of them is it starts by saying it's really as much about people as the inanimate object. So I think there's a risk with the words Internet of Things, that people think about the things, maybe the internet. Um, and they also, researchers tend to think about these things that they're designing in the lab um, rather than out in the wild. But the really important point here is the Internet of Things is already here. We're already living in the Internet of Things. Um, this isn't something we can design in the lab and put out there. It's there. So this is a kind of back to front compared to some research projects. It's very much research in the wild. And that sort of... Um, that metaphor at the top, seizing the tiger by the tail, is I think the appropriate uh, animal metaphor for this. The um, internet is out there. What we can do is engage with it in use and help the UK uh, harness the economic value to, uh, to deal with security and cyber security issues. There are other animal metaphors, like shutting the stable door after the horse is bolted. I don't think that's the one. I think it's seizing the tiger by the tail. Um, What I'll just do is give just an overview of the, of the project. Now, there are nine partners, and I think many, looking through the list of partners, which is on the bottom of the slide, there are people here at the event who are representatives of those partners. So some of you may already be involved in Petrus, and if you're not, you may have colleagues who are. So one way of following up um, is to uh, pursue this back, uh, back at the shop, as it were. So UCL, Warwick Imperial College, Lancaster, Oxford, Surrey, Southampton, Edinburgh, and Cardiff. In fact, there are five core partners and four spokes. So the, the cores are, are UCL, Imperial, Warwick, Lancaster, Oxford, and the other four spokes. Um, and uh, let's see, we've got the Software Sustainability Institute partners are all there. So that's, that has to be a good potential engagement there, a bridge between the two. Um, it's led by Jeremy Watson at UCL, and the deputy director is Emil Lupu at Imperial. Uh, these are some of the words from the early presentations of the project. In fact, these are the sort of slides that we use when we were pitching the project to UPSRC for funding. I won't read it all out. Many of you have seen slides like this before. But I think the important sense to get from this is it's set up very much as um, technical and social at the same time. And in fact, that structure is really designed into the project. So every stream of activity in the project has two lead co-investigators. One of them is a social lead, one of them is a technical lead. So we absolutely went for socio-technical. Uh, so that's one of the principles um, in there. And 
it's about sort of removing the barriers to adoption. Um, I'm, I'm actually the social theme lead on harnessing economic value. Um, so in a way, I think that's all about how, how, how do we make the best financial value um, or societal value from international things. But the, the, the other side of that, which is quite important to this talk, is what are the risks and how do we avoid the risks? Um, and actually, it's the risks that I want to focus on when I drill down in a minute in, in one project. Uh, and I've always been someone who gives quite utopian talks, as many of you know. But my, my Internet of Things talks have got a bit dystopian. And there was a key moment uh, during the, uh, the, the Blackett Review, which uh, I was involved in, and then this proposal, which is really relevant to our discussions today. So I went to an, um, an Internet of Things event. It was in London at uh, Leicester. And it had four panels, and essentially it was the electronics industry presenting what they were doing with the Internet of Things. Uh, and it worked, out, worked its way up through the stack. So in the, the first panel, it was sort of looking at the physical layer, then it went up to the software, and eventually it got to users. Now, there are a number of distinctive things about this event um, that, that, that could concern us. One of them is that the panels, some of the last one, were all male, which is an interesting thing. I'm not quite right. Uh, um, the other, another is that the software panel, before the morning coffee break, Involved sort of people standing up and saying, you know, we're going to sell how many millions of devices into your homes, into your cars, into your bodies. Um, and, then, and, and, and they all discuss sort of software aspects and standardization. And I put my hand up. I, I really ask questions in panels, but I had to ask this question. And I said, uh, could I ask the panel what they're doing about software vulnerabilities? And one by one, they went along the panel and they avoided answering the question. Uh, which led to some interesting discussions over coffee. So really... I realized then there was a kind of benign world assumption. People are designing products in the Internet of Things markets uh, with a particular use intended, and they expect that's how they're going to be used. They haven't thought about the full life cycle of those products. They haven't thought about what happens when things go wrong. They, in particular, they haven't thought about what happens when things get assembled in ways that uh, they hadn't anticipated, uh, applied in ways they hadn't anticipated. As I mentioned on the panel yesterday, this notion of responsible innovation is quite tricky when you're creating small things that get assembled uh, at speed into, into larger... Um, sort of assemblies. Um, so I, I got quite worried about the whole software thing, and I've been very concerned um, to keep mentioning software in all the meetings that have occurred since then. And, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this mini workshop, because I'm really not seeing enough conversation around that. And it's not just about vulnerability to threat, it's about uh, potential failure, and I'll say some more about that. So the picture that describes the hub looks like this, and that's the, the hub itself, and it's um, in partner sites and spokes, uh, you'll notice that there are a lot of private sector research partners. And this is the, the Tiger by the Tail piece. This isn't a project where you give researchers some, some grant money and they do some interesting research. This is a project where uh, the, uh, the user partners engage with the researchers to tackle real issues. Um, and then that's funded from within the project. So it's absolutely user partner layer. There are about 50 user partners. Uh, so so it's, it's very, very much in the world. It has to be, because that thing things is already here. As Caroline mentioned yesterday on the panel, there are other investments in this space, a total of about 40 million. Um, yesterday, you also heard about the City Bird demonstrator in Manchester. <coughs> any questions about that? <laughs> um, so it all fits together into this bigger landscape picture. And then the sort of the, the, the Petrus in a, in a slide. Uh, Key facts. Um, so we've got the nine universities. Of the five core partners, four of them coincidentally are cheering partners. It wasn't intended to be a cheering bid at all. That wouldn't have made any difference anyway, but it happens that they are. Um, if you look at the people who were involved in the Blackett Review, quite a lot of them are represented in this project as well. So much of that review and expertise and background has come directly into the project. Uh, we, we did an interesting thing from a, a proposal by some people. Um, and we committed to the activities in detail for the first year of the project, uh, but then left some flexibility for what happened afterwards. And the reason was with this end user engagement model, when the bid went in, we were competing with other bids. We couldn't get all the end user partners we wanted. Once we were funded, we then wanted to be able to go back to them. So actually, we're just at the point now, a year in, where we've gone back out to user partners, and there's been a new round of internal funding uh, within the project. So if you want to know more about it, there's a good website, petrushub.org, and it structures all these little mini projects into various areas. You can look at them under themes, you can look at them under application areas. 
I'm not going to go into details of the, the metaphysics of Petrus because there are constellations and test beds and mini projects. And just, anyway, <laughs> it's all there on the website. You can find all these individual projects that are occurring within it or with end user partners. There's one of those in particular that I want to talk about now. It's called Cyber Risk Assessment for Capital Systems. Uh, it's one that I'm leading with Sadie Crease in Oxford, um, who is uh, a part of the Oxford uh, Cyber Security. And the backdrop to this, I think, is very relevant to, to the, the audience here because um, this, this relates to sort of HPC as well as IoT. So let's get these two things onto, onto a diagram. This four quadrant diagram is ubiquitous. Um, I offer it to you as a gift. You've probably seen it many times before. Um, what you do is you take these four quadrants and you take the title of your talk and you put it in the top right hand quadrant. It's never failed me. <laughs> Um, but you can, you can see interesting trajectories around this. So, in the old days, we did things with small numbers of computers and small numbers of people. Um, and then, many of us who have been involved in e-science and e-research have taken a trajectory towards using sort of big computations to solve big science problems. That's what we've done since the, the late 90s. Um, but then, over time, increasingly engaging more and more human beings in this process, uh, whether they're users or whether, for example, they're citizen scientists. At the same time, in, a, in another part of our academic life, the sort of Science 2.0 world or the um, um, web science world, we had this other trajectory that, that this, this vertical axis was really well understood. The next century tells us how many transistors that fit on whatever it is, and how much it will cost, what our storage will be, what our, how many cores we'll have in the future. Those curves are published. This one on the bottom didn't have published curves. This is the increasing engagement of citizens around the globe um, in the digital world, thanks to the web, thanks to devices like smartphones. So um, it's, it's one that in some senses has been less planned and has perhaps taken people by surprise. Uh, and it's really that combination of the large numbers of people and now a large amount of tech that takes us into this, this crazy, interesting, complex world in the top right hand quadrant. Not everything has to be up there. I'm entirely happy that air traffic control is still down here, not done on Twitter, but you know, things could change. Uh, but uh, really, the, uh, the computation of people coming together in the top right. Sometimes. That's where the big data is generated, all our interactions with the digital world are generating the data. Sometimes it's where it's analyzed. So, for example, uh, citizens of science coming along at a, at a sort of a moment in time now where humans are better than computers at analyzing certain things and can scale up from the individual to the, to the crowd and deal with more data. That might just be a sweet spot that we, we're going past. And there'll be even more data and we'll run out of humans. I mean, basically, this what this virtual one seems to keep going. But we will hit, hit a ceiling on the number of humans, um, and that argues in favour of automation and all the all the worries and movies and panels about AI uh, and machine learning that are occurring. You can have some sort of sticking things on this picture. Um, I think your favourite projects on there, but I sort of whoops, I put automation up there at the top right or AI um, because uh, if you think about where this is all going, then the arrows kind of go to the right and and, and, and probably more up. Um, although possibly AI isn't where there are large numbers of people, maybe AI should be over on the left. I'm not sure we could argue about the position of AI. Certainly, what's happening in the citizen science world is that there's more data. What people are doing, um, Project Data University in Oxford, um, are learning from what the humans are doing uh, to train the machines to scale up the, the, the throughput of the processing. So, we're seeing that automation kick in. Um, the universe has been fascinating. It, it, so first of all, there's Galaxy Zoo, 165,000 users, that's a long spiral of galaxies. <coughs> we refactored into the Zooniverse platform, new projects being released every few weeks. And then we factored again into Panoptes, which is the current platform. So any of you can log in and create your own citizen science projects. Um, it's all a bit on my mind at the moment. And it's yeah, well over a million users now. It's on my mind because today or tonight we'll be stargazing live, being launched. Um, that's handled on the Zooniverse platform. It's also part of the um, the web observatory work that's going on in Southampton, and a lot of my emails today has been people trying to get everything ready for quite huge numbers of users later today. It's hoping nothing falls over. Um, what we see there is people, large numbers of people coming together with large amounts of technology. People are interacting with each other in the physical world as we are now, but also in the digital world through social media. Um, the devices, when we're working with these sort of things, are coupled maybe electronically, but also physically. All the devices in this room are, are connected together because they're in this room. Um, so the systems are becoming more complex and more coupled. 
there's a, there's a sociology book from the 80s called Normal Accidents, uh, which sort of makes some observations about situations in which systems go wrong. And so if, if it's complex, and if you have this tight coupling so you can get cascading effects, um, and if it has some catastrophic potential, some risk to life, then you know, b bad things are, are going to happen. Now, take that in mind from the 80s and think where we are with internet of things. Greater scale, greater complexity, greater coupling, greater automation. It ain't going to be any better, right? So we have to, I think, be concerned about these things. And whereas a lot of people in the internet of things and in Petrus are saying, how do we make these systems reliable and robust and secure so they don't break? I was saying that they're going to break. Right? Uh, there are all sorts of assumptions we make that are no longer true. Um, so what do we do when they break? And that's, that's my interest. Um, a, a typical assumption that may, people make that's false now is about closed systems. People believe you can even create a closed computer system that protects you from the outside world and nothing can interfere with it. It's really hard because we couple the systems. We walk around with devices. We enter spaces. Our devices communicate. Um, if you look at these things from a social and technical viewpoint, it's really difficult to assume that such things are closed systems. Another assumption that's challenged by Internet of Things is that at the moment you can sort of turn off bits of the internet, you have some throttle points to, to control things, um, but uh, what are the throttle points when everything's completely devolved and distributed? I, I was giving a talk at Cape Town University um, a, a year or so ago uh, during a student riot. Student riots about feeds must fall and roads must fall. It was a very complex time, socio politically. Um, but while I was in the room, I had some senior members of the university there, and they were trying to make a decision as to whether or not to turn off EduRef. Because if they turned off EduRef, it would prevent the students um, uh, coordinating on social media the riots that were occurring. If they didn't turn it off, then they wouldn't know what the students were doing. Um, but so, so, so you know, these total points we still have, like, like EduRef, um, we'll, we'll, you know, it's, it's not clear where the control points will be within social things. So this particular project within uh, Petrus takes a look at this as a sort of scoping study, and it, and it argues in terms of risk assessment methodologies. So currently, when we assess risks in systems, we use some very, very traditional methodologies. I don't think they take account of digital very well. Um, I don't think they take account of how rapidly systems get assembled. Um, you, know, you want to do a risk assessment once for, for, or once a year or something, but really, maybe you need to do one as you assemble the system. Ah, but then we just made the system even more complicated and more prone to failure. So. Hmm, interesting challenges there. So that, I wanted to put the whole risk thing there because I think software will fail because it fails and software will fail because it's vulnerable to threat. Right? Uh, and that's something that we need to, to think about in terms of software and users of things. So that's enough from me in, in terms of scene setting. Um, the whole we sort of ask the questions about the conversation. It'd be interesting just to throw open what's different about internet of things software and research software um, as opposed to other things we may be doing on an everyday basis. Now, to me, the most obvious one comes from um, my experience a few years ago when I ran a, a, a center for pervasive computing in the environment, NVSense, where we were deploying early flood uh, sensor uh, networks. And one of the things you learn very rapidly is your only homogeneous deployment is your first one. After that, <laughs> um, once these things are out there, you can't touch them again. We were dropping probes down holes in, in Glacier, the curable hot water drills. You know, uh, whenever you, you drop it down the hole, you're never going to see that again. Not, not for quite a few years anyway. It won't look the same when it comes out. Um, it will stop working sometime. You don't know when. It might, it might start working again at some time. You don't know when. This is the crazy world. But you can't, you can't reboot it and start again. You can't reboot it and do a software upgrade. Um, many devices that we're carrying with us do have that, but some of these deployments don't. So once you device and stuff, and then other people walk in with other devices, or you do a second deployment in a space, um, you're immediately in a heterogeneous environment. That feels different to, uh, I was just saying, maybe not completely different, but different emphasis um, to what we're used to with the computer systems that we're, we're using today, where we could, we could just reboot it. We turn it off and on again. You can't turn these things off and on again. They turn themselves off and on again, and you can't control it. Um, so that, that strikes me as, as one significant difference, but there may be very many others, and I haven't thought hard about this. I mean, reproducibility in the world of research and uses and essential things clearly needs some discussion. I don't think I have any answer. Can I turn this open? What's, what's your reaction to the, the Internet of Things software ecosystem versus the research software ecosystem that we're deeply familiar with in the room? Uh, the yeah. I get is, is what you know is difficult now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
there are all sorts of safety procedures in place and it, uh, they're different from different verticals. So if, if you were sort of pulling devices into your car, there would be many constraints. But then, you, as you say, um, you can build something with any set things, keep your given that confidence and then just get into your car <laughs> and interact with stuff. So, toys, toys are really scary. <laughs> yeah, so sort of doll dolls and things like that, you know, that, that Apple worked at one of their customers from a very early age. Well, that, that, that story of a child who um, uh, asked, asked uh, Alexa for, for, for the doll cats, uh, and then uh, that I mean, was covered as a news item on the radio, thus ordering lots of dolls houses for all the Alexas that heard the radio. Is <laughs> <laughs> Alexa still on fixed that? Is it still possible to? I think it's yeah. fixed. I don't know the details. They've not fixed it. Sorry, no, they've not fixed it. They've not fixed it. still on fixed. <laughs> yeah, because I was thinking of getting one and I saw, the, um, saw that article and thought, yeah, not getting one. <laughs> <laughs> so these, these are the unintended <laughs> consequences. <laughs> 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 so that goes back to my worry. People are designing these things with a purpose in mind, and people are doing completely different things with them, deliberately or accidentally. Yeah. I think it's a good observation about research software. So, so what's the difference between, sounds like a joke, but what's the difference <laughs> between the research software ecosystem, the Internet of Things, software ecosystem? Uh, in both cases, we're <coughs> hacking things up quickly. Uh, I, the catastrophic potential is one of them. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's sort of. For research software, and it's, uh, usually the hardware tends to be quite stable, and the software is quite stable, and the internet things, uh -huh. they both potentially flaky, and they're both up to development, and yeah, I mean, that, I'm making this video a lot. No, this is good. Also, this is very good. I, I want to take notes. <laughs> yes. That's a very good one. How's your device? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important just to 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 recognise that you can realise that you can have a brand new thing and say, hey, we're going out to scale this thing for us. So when you then deploy that to different systems, you can just um, self replicate the thing that that thing. That's a very worrying
A useful way of thinking about the Jordan project and the Jordan Valley is, is IoT as an attack surface. So as we deploy this, it becomes you know, the, the surface by which we you know, receive the threat. Um, I, another scenario that I mind the other day, in, in Oxford, um, we have a building, a tin building, which uh, had several hundred researchers in it. It's just in clothes at short notice to be sure asbestos. Um, so these researchers are camping all over the place in the morning. Um, they made me think, you know, you know, on, on sort of the internet of things asbestos. You know, well, one day you discover that you have this old component of devices in your building, in your building management system for so many years ago, and um, you know, it's under threat for some reason. So what do you do? Or, or maybe it's installed by, you know, created by one country who was an ally and is no longer an ally as so international boundaries get redrawn. There are all sorts of uh, things that go wrong because of the, the, the length of time that these deployments may persist. Uh, somebody else is dystopian. <laughs> okay, thank you. That, that that's helpful. Um, now, if you wanted to do something about this, uh, I find myself in a position where we could try and start some of these conversations. And as I said, for example, for example the Software Sustainability Institute partners, Petrus partners. Many of you here are from other Petrus partners. Um, and Internet of Things isn't just Petrus; it's everywhere. So um, we can all engage in this conversation. But what, what is it we want to say? Um, so there's two directions to this. It's what, we, what, what we've learned about software that we want to say to the Internet of Things community. Um, and then the other way around is um, you know, what we want to say to researchers about the Internet of Things. As the uh, experts in this room on Internet of Things is in quotes. This is a rare moment where all the expertise is in one place. Um, in the uh, discussions this morning about um, possible areas uh, for hackathons and, and collaborations. Um, we talked about the possibility of or, or the need for an Internet of Things guide for researchers. So at the moment, it's, there's quite a learning curve if a researcher turns to use devices and for all sorts of reasons. And there's a question of whether there is practical help or some principles or some advice that can be provided um, to help researchers who are embracing the Internet of Things. So that was just one of the ideas. Can I just throw it open? How do we have this conversation? What do we want to say? So, Carol. I guess when we're talking about. So, the end users of things are the specifiers. Right. In moments. And I think that's an interesting question because I think the big issue here is that as we said, first of all, is that we don't know things are being designed for a particular purpose, but they're going to be reappropriated, yeah. and that might be in a, in a good way or it might be in a bad way. And so, I guess the extent to which we can identify the, the end user and then have that conversation with them is, is kind of an interesting question. So, when you talk about health data, for example, and we sort of say so there is very you know, do we tell people is health data that normalise? Do we tell them that we're using them or not? Do we want to get consent from the limit of all of these kinds of things? And that's very kind of specific circumstance. But I don't know to what extent. So are we just talking about people developing things for themselves and having them in their homes, or is it kind of city wide? Is it you know commercial applications or research funds? Or I, I think it's a really interesting question, and, and, and again plays to this this audience because we are people who are not necessarily designing. Things for the end users, sometimes we're the tool builders that people then assemble for other people to use, but tools for the people who build the experiences. So, we, 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 yeah, we have a particularly different audience in that respect. Um, that's very, that's a very good point. And yeah, we should look at different scenarios and look at who the users are, who the developers are, where the responsibilities lie. And this comes back to my point yesterday about responsible innovation. Um, we, can, we can, I suppose, if Effectively, like software carpentry, maybe we should do the brains and things carpentry. But it's, um, it's it's training people um, with to understand some of this. Hmm, it's, I think software carpentry is a thing. <laughs> Any other thoughts about this conversation? What should I go? If, if I write an email to to Petrus after the, after today saying we've had a discussion about this and this is the key point, what is the key point? 
specifically to fix these things because it's not project wise yet. So the trick the trick would be to establish those policies in its first year of the project and then roll it out. So the Oscar Internet Institute is leading on um, ethics and we shown that to Eddie and then he's doing that. Um, but I don't think we've rolled out uh, a, an approach to ethics and IAC across the whole project yet. So that, that would be um, I think it's a really important thing to do because it also demonstrates the value of the collaboration on the project, otherwise we're all going to do a sort of separate, fascinating case studies <laughs> and not learn. So yeah, I think that, 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 that's a very good point. I wonder if there'll be a set of principles. Um, this idea of a set of ethical principles has been discussed quite a lot. It kind of goes back to um, Asimov's laws of robotics. It's sort of, you know, what are the, what are the, the laws of internet and devices in terms of do no harm, etc. Uh, um, Alan, Winfield, um, who's responsible for an AHRC, EPSRC set of robo ethical principles a while back. And they're interesting to look at. So as it is actually about robots, you just cross out robot and put whatever it is you're working, Internet of Things, social media, whatever it is. Any of us who are constructing things could be paying attention to a set of principles like that. So but what are the what are the principles for IOC? We used to have a mentality where um, you have to be able to update operating systems to keep them secure. Mm. Yeah, so, so. Well, also, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's true. This, this, this Mac, because I'm ahead of the bomb, is, is, is encrypted with an also standard encryption software, which has prevented me upgrading the operating system for three versions. Yeah. Is that yeah. better or worse for security? <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the interesting kind of retro thing going on here, for those of you who have programmed Arduinos or whatever, but who once upon a time were using microcomputers in the, uh, in the 80s, and probably having a wonderfully nostalgic time. Um, it's really interesting, to, in a way, when we have this discussion about internet things, it's like saying, what have we learned in the last 30 years? Uh, how, do you, how do you, if you went back to the, the BBC Micro or 6 5 or 2, you know, how would we do it differently? I think that's an interesting computing history experiment. Perhaps we should be finishing because it's one minute to go and other people are arriving. Thank you very much. I, I am going to now try and kick off an email to Petrus. <laughs> thank you for your comments. It's been, it's been very helpful and I hope I've started this, this conversation going. Thanks very much. <laughs>